Today's show is sponsored by Stamps.com. We at TCB have been using Stamps.com every day for years. When we first started selling our merch to our listeners and sending out gifts to our subscribers, I would drive to the post office every Friday with a box of packages. Then I stood in line and filled out the addresses by hand, and I paid full price for shipping. So not only was this time consuming, it was annoying to the people behind me in line. Then I found Stamps.com. With Stamps.com, all I need is a computer and a printer. They even sent us a free scale, so we had everything we needed to get started right away, saving time and money. And if you need your packages picked up, you can schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. I just print my address labels as the orders come in, and then they're picked up once a week. No need for me to leave the office at all. Stamps.com also has huge carrier discounts up to 84% off, USPS, and UPS rates. And they automatically tell you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. So set your business up for success and get started with Stamps.com today. Now you can sign up with promo code TCB for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a free digital scale. There are also no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and enter our code. TCB. True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. After a 911 call came in late at night on August 2, 2006, paramedics were dispatched to a high-end Washington, D.C. townhouse. Inside, the home was very neat with expensive electronics and other valuables in plain sight. On the second floor, 32-year-old attorney Robert Wan was found lying flat on his back in a t-shirt and gym shorts. He had three stab wounds to his torso. Mr. Wan was a house guest that night, and the three permanent residents claimed to have no idea who had stabbed him, but the home had absolutely no signs of forced entry or a burglary. Join us at the quiet end for Murder Mystery on Swan Street. From the time they arrived, police officers and paramedics were struck by the incongruous scene. All three residents of the home were together in the living room, freshly showered and wearing crisp white robes. The bed where Mr. Wan was found appeared strikingly undisturbed, and despite having suffered three deep knife wounds, there was very little blood on Mr. Wan or the bedding. The lack of an intruder, the physical evidence and the bizarre behavior of the Holmes residents have created an extraordinary mystery surrounding Robert Wan's death, a mystery that still endures today. So the beer for today is from a Washington, D.C. brewing company, D.C. Brow Brewing in Washington. It's uh, IPA called The Corruption. Pretty apt title for a beer in Washington, D.C., huh? Absolutely. Possibly. So this beer is pretty nice. It's an orange color, a little small off-white head, nice aroma, citrus and pine. The, the taste is mostly pine, a little bit of grapefruit. Very nice example of what is considered a West Coast IPA. Absolutely. It sounds good. I could do without the pine, but I love a little grapefruit in my life. So let's open it up. Okay. All right. I'm really excited to talk about this because this truly is a mystery. So come on down here at the quiet end. And I'd just like to say that this case was suggested to us by Carly. And thank you, Carly. It's fascinating. Yeah, this is a puzzle. It really is. It really is. And I can't wait to hear what our listeners think and what their opinions and speculations are. So today we're going to start out a bit differently than we usually do. We'll get to the background of Robert and the others involved in this case, but let's first listen to the 911 call that came in that night 
when Robert was found stabbed inside the townhouse of his three friends, Joseph Price, Victor Zaborski, and Dylan Ward. This call came in at 11.49 p.m. on August 2nd from Victor Zaborski. It's about seven minutes long, and I really want you to pay attention to the tone of the caller, the background noises or lack of background noises, and some of the questions that are asked, because like Dick said, it is a puzzle. NBC Emergency 911 Operator 6752. Do you need police, fire, or ambulance? Me, please. I'm an ambulance. What's wrong, ma'am? We, just, uh, we had someone that was in our house, evidently, and they stabbed somebody. Okay, somebody's inside the house now? Okay. I don't know. We heard. Are they bleeding? You see someone yes. bleeding? Someone is bleeding in our house. Okay, where's they bleeding from? Uh, I think he's. I think in the stomach. In the stomach? Is he cautious? Uh, Calm down for me. I'm going to send some help, okay? Female or male? It's a male. He's a friend of ours. He was, spent, he was spending the night with us. Okay. And who was the person that stabbed him? Do you know? Is, he, is, is he cautious? We need an ambulance. Ma'am, right listen to me. He's not conscious. He's not conscious at all? No. We need someone right now. Is he breathing? Is listen, he, listen to me. Calm down. I'm going to help you, okay? Is he breathing? <sighs> I'm upstairs, and he's downstairs. I don't know. Okay, who's downstairs with him? My partner is downstairs with him right now. He told me to go upstairs and call the police immediately. I just went to the stairs. And okay, who's the person? Okay, I'm sending paramedics and the police. Okay, who's the person that stabbed him? I don't know. We think it's somebody with an intruder in the house. We heard the chime of the door. <sighs> And it's 15, ma'am, calm down. 1509 Swan Street, Northwest, am I correct? Yes, it is. The person that says, is she still in the home? I don't know. Okay, we got help in route, okay? Pardon me? We have help in route. Thank you. Okay. They are laying around to you now. I'm saying the police and the paramedics, okay, to assist. Okay, what I need you to do is go downstairs, okay? The place where, wherever he was stabbed at, I need you to get a dry cloth, okay? And just apply pressure to that area. If he was wherever he was stabbed at on his body, I need you to take a towel downstairs while you're waiting for the paramedics to arrive and just apply pressure. Even if the rag or towel is saturated with blood, just get another towel and put it on top, but never lift the, the first towel off the area. Hold it on. Once it gets filled up with blood, just put a number of towel on top of that and just apply pressure until the paramedics arrive. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The heart. In the heart? Yes. In the center of his chest. Okay. Is he breathing? Is he breathing? We have help him right now, okay? You don't know who it was? No idea. Don't touch, don't touch, just like that. Okay, is he breathing? He's breathing, but he needs help now. Okay, we have help in route, ma'am, okay? We do have help in route. Okay, just go down there and try to tell your husband or your other, um, the other half to just try to keep him calm and talk to him, okay? Keep him calm and talk to him until someone gets there. Okay. And at the same time, get a dry cloth and just hold it right there in the area. My partner's holding the okay, it, holding it on him. Okay, and once it gets saturated with blood, then I'm get another one. Go get another towel okay. so you can apply it on top of that one once it gets filled up with blood. Okay. We need well, we need you to apply pressure on that area. He is applying pressure right there. Okay, just hold it there until the paramedics get there. They should be pulling up any moment if they're already en route to your location. You don't know who did this. We have no idea who did this. Is the door open so they can get in? We don't know how they got in. Okay, well, I'm asking you now, is the door open so the paramedics can get in once they get here? What? I'm sorry. What were you saying? Is the door open so they can get in? Is the okay. door open so the, so the paramedics can get in the home? I'm going to go down. Is this a private home or apartment? It's, it's a home. It's a home. It's 1509 Swan Street, Northwest. The person had one of our, our knives. The person that stabbed him ran out the door with a knife? I, I think so. Uh, okay, anybody get any type of description of the person that came in the home? I have no idea. We have no description. We heard we heard the chime and 
and we heard the scream from our friend. Okay. And so we came running downstairs. We ran in. So you both was upstairs and your friend was downstairs. Yes. You heard the door open and then you heard the scream. We didn't. I didn't hear the door open until after the scream, and then we ran down the stairs and we heard we are we have an alarm, and so the chime went off. Okay. Is the ambulance? We really need the ambulance. Okay, they in Rome. They in Rome now, ma'am. Go to the door. They should be pulling up any moment. Okay. I'm afraid to go downstairs. Okay. The person who's downstairs was the person that was assaulted. No, we're in the we're on the second floor. Okay. So somebody need to go downstairs, open the door for the paramedics. You're not sure if that person's still in the home or not. I have no idea. Okay. We have paramedics in route. Okay. What time is it? What time is it at the moment? Yes. 23.54. It's 11.54, ma'am. 11.54. Yes. I mean... I'll stay on the line with you. I will stay on the line until somebody gets here, okay? I won't hang up. We need them right now. I'm not hanging up, but we need, we need help now. Okay. They are en route, ma'am. They are en route. <sighs> Let me know when you hear the paramedics. Can you look out the window and see if you handle coming? I'm, I'm looking out the window and I see nothing. I see nobody. Okay, it seems like forever, but they are en route, ma'am. They're coming. I do. Here they are. Here they are. They're there. <laughs> I'm going downstairs. Okay. I'll stand in line with you till you open the door for the paramedics, okay? <laughs> We have someone with stab They're on our second floor. <laughs> Ma'am. No, it's really an emergency. I mean, he may be. He's sorry. <laughs> Ma'am, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> okay, Dickie, so what do you think? Well, in those seven minutes, I, I think the caller, and that, that's Victor who did the calling? Yes, yes. He sounds like he's losing it. So, yes, I agree. I think he sounds genuine. I mean, and, and as the call goes on, by the end of the, the call, he's almost hysterical. I agree. Now, some people have said that he was faking it, but I think he sounds pretty genuine. Yeah, I was not being that knowledgeable about how that all works, but it, it sounded to me that he was really distressed. Yes. Now, the 911 operator kept calling him ma'am, but he did sound like a female. He was very hysterical. Yeah. Yeah. And he does seem really upset. It sounds like he, like he said, he, he initiated the call from the top floor of his bedroom or his room. Well, there's a good question. If they go down and they find Robert on the second floor, stabbed... And why did Joe Price tell Victor to go upstairs and call when there was a phone down on the second floor? That will be confirmed. So right. there's one thing. Um, I find it realistic that he said he was afraid to go downstairs, but he says something about thinking that the intruder has one of their knives. Why would he think that when there was a knife on the bedside table? Because right, well, there was. Yeah, maybe they hadn't noticed that yet. Perhaps, but why would he think it was one of their knives then? Why not think an intruder came in with his own knife? That's true. So that's suspicious to me. Well, and it sounds like he, he started upstairs and then he came down the stairs because he's talking both to the 911 operator and he's talking to Joseph. Yeah, after three or four minutes, I right. think he is back on the second floor with Joseph. And then Joseph asks him what time it is at that moment, so... That, to me, is an odd question as well. Yeah, there's absolutely nothing that's germane to knowing what time it is. I wouldn't think so. No, I wouldn't think so at all. Also, I think I heard him say that Robert was breathing. Yeah, there was one time. I know she asked him three or four times if Robert was breathing, and I think one time it sounded like he said yes. Yeah. But yeah. this was like the third time she had asked. Okay. Hmm. Okay, well, what about her very thorough instructions about applying towels? 
and leaving a towel and adding another towel and applying pressure to his chest. Yeah, she went over that twice. She did. I don't recall that they, there was any mention of towels found at the scene. No, once the responders were there, I think that there were no saturated towels, no towels on his chest at all. Right. So that's very confusing as well. Because Victor had said they were applying pressure to the chest. He did. Yeah, he did. Uh, so if so, that was the case, where were the blood-soaked so towels? Where, where are the towels? Yes. So that's a big question. So do you think there was urgency in that call? I think there was urgency in that call. Okay. But you think that maybe there was some cover-up going on already? Well, there's some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Some suspicious things. Yeah. Okay. And, and remember, what they, he asked what time it was. She said at 11.54. Or 2354, whatever. Yeah, so they'd been on the phone about five minutes at that point. Right. Uh, And not that we know that at the time, but we're going to find out later. That's as much as 79 minutes after Robert got there. Yes. So what's been going on throughout there? Exactly. And we'll go over all of that. But the call, I just think, is very important in getting the foundation of this. Yeah, well, I would say that it sounds to me like uh, Victor was really freaked out by it, uh, and probably didn't have anything to do with it, just because he's so freaked out. Okay. That's just an initial guess. Yeah, absolutely. That's my initial impression of it, is that he was very upset. But we're going to get into why we think he was so upset and what he came across before he made the call. Yes. What was the situation prior to the call? That's very important, of course. Oh, sure. So once on the scene at 11.54 p.m., The two EMS responders saw that Robert was dead, and in fact had been dead for some time. So big question there, because Victor had said he was breathing. Right. Okay. Once he said that. When EMS responder number one first approached the front door, he saw a white man, and that turned out to be Victor, standing on the front steps of 1509 Swan Street. Now, Victor was wearing a white bathrobe, and he's talking on his cell phone. EMS responder number one asked Zaborski what was going on, and EMS responder number one asked Victor what was going on, and Victor did not answer, kept his head down, didn't even turn towards the EMS responder. But the responder did overhear him saying something about a stabbing on the second floor. Uh, This is a three-story townhouse. So EMS responder number one went inside through the front door. Yeah, so EMS responder number one had been working in this field for over 10 years. He went up to the second floor, followed by EMS responder number two. As they went up the stairs, they saw Dylan Ward, also wearing a white bathrobe, walking down a small hallway from an adjoining bathroom. As Ward approached the EMS responders, responder number one asked him, what's going on? And according to this responder, Ward just looked at him and didn't say anything. Yeah, so if I'm an EMS guy, I'm thinking, this is really fucking weird. They did think so, yes. I I got the first guy on the phone outside the townhouse, nice white bathrobe. The guy inside has also a nice white robe on. Neither of them will respond to me. I'm saying, what the hell's going on here? Yeah, and there were witness accounts from other responders that they looked like they had just showered. Like their hair was wet and slicked back. So that's incredibly suspicious. Dylan Ward walked past the responders and into his bedroom, which was on the second floor. So we had a guest room on the second floor where Robert was found, and Dylan Ward's bedroom was on the second floor. The other two men had a bedroom on the third floor. As EMS responder number one walked toward the front of the house on the second floor, he saw Joseph Price. Joseph Price was wearing only his underwear and sitting on the edge of the pull-out bed in the room at the front of the house overlooking the street, the guest room. Now, Price had his back to them and was not applying pressure to Robert's wounds. Actually, he was not touching Robert one at all. When asked what was going on, Price said that he had heard a scream, and then Price got up from the bed and, keeping his back to the EMS responders, he moved sideways away from the bed. So this guy at least would acknowledge them and speak with them, but uh-huh. he wouldn't face them. He wouldn't look at them. 
And he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. No. Somebody said that pressure was being applied. Victor said that, yes. He said his, his partner, who would have been Joe Price, was applying pressure to Robert's chest. Yeah, uh, weird stuff. It's very odd. The EMS responders were really puzzled by the behavior of Zaborski, Ward, and Price. As a paramedic for over 10 years, the first responder had responded to hundreds of scenes involving victims of violence. And in his experience, people at the scene were yelling about what had happened, and they were always trying to direct him to the victim to provide medical help as soon as possible. But now at this scene, the behavior of the three men, he would say, made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. It was that odd. He would later explain that he was so concerned that he had visually checked Joseph Price's hands for any weapons as he entered the guest room where Robert was. He had even approached Robert from the opposite side of the pull-out bed so that he could keep his eyes on Joe Price as he worked on Robert Wan. So this, this is a, an experienced EMS person who's so freaked out that he's not going to turn his back on this guy, on Price. No, I think he saw Joe Price as a possible perpetrator, as the yeah. one who had done the deed. Right. It's just everything's acting so weird. He's freaked out. Yes. So EMS responder number two had been working for over 15 years. And she, too, would say that she immediately felt like something was very wrong with the scene. She saw a wound on Robert's chest, which was big enough to fit a finger into, but there was no blood on the victim, on the floor, or anywhere else in the room. She also noticed there were no signs that anything had happened in the room, aside from Robert's condition, of course. In fact, she would say it looked like Robert's body had been stabbed, showered, redressed, and placed in the bed. Yeah, that's one of the comments I found most disturbing. Well, the, you have to come up with some explanation for how the scene looked, right? Yeah, and yeah. they know what these scenes look like. They know what to expect, and this is not what would be expected. No. And just the idea that he had been stabbed and then cleaned up, that's homicide. There's no way around it. So responder number one examined Robert and saw three apparent stab wounds to his chest. He found no pulse at his wrist, his femoral artery, or his carotid artery in his neck. His pupils were fixed and dilated, and he wasn't breathing. Strangely, there was no blood coming from any of his wounds. The paramedics put him on an EKG monitor, which indicated that he was in a systole, meaning a complete flat line, no heart activity. There was very little blood on his chest, as if it had been cleaned up. Responder number one would say that he saw only a light film of blood, but it had striation marks, as if someone had wiped Robert's chest down with a towel. So maybe they did. Put a towel on and pressure. Then where were the towels? Well, okay. You got me there. <laughs> yeah. Now the responders saw the wounds and thought that they looked more like surgical incisions than just a stabbing attack. With no signs of life, paramedics took Robert to the hospital, where he was officially pronounced dead at 12.25 a.m. August 3rd, 2006. This was just 36 minutes after Victor Zaborski first made that call to 911. Police arrived at 1509 Swan Street as the paramedics were attending to Robert Wan. Their home is a very high-end, nicely furnished one in uh, near the DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. has a value of over $1 million. Nice place. Very neat and orderly, and there were expensive items out in the open throughout the home. Robert was found lying in the second-floor guest room slash home office on a pull-out bed. Rooms at the front of the house it's furthest from the stairs leading from the first floor to the second floor. So you got to go up the stairs and walk all the way down the hall to get to that room. Right. So from the model I'd seen, as soon as you get to the second floor, you're going to see Dylan Ward's bedroom door right there. Yeah, you're facing his door. But if there was an intruder, he did not enter Dylan Ward's room, which was right there. He had to make a 180 degree turn down the hall to the guest room. So Robert was lying flat on his back with his head on a pillow, and his arms were lying at his sides. He was wearing a gray William & Mary t-shirt, gym shorts, and underwear. His daytime clothing was neatly folded on a table at the foot of the bed. Examinations of his t-shirt did show three cuts, which generally corresponded to the three stab wounds. 
He was also wearing his night guards in his mouth, which he wore every night to prevent him from grinding his teeth. Of note to investigators was that nothing in the room appeared to be out of place at all. There was no sign that anyone had rummaged through the room for valuables. Also, Robert's wallet, his Movada watch, and Blackberry were all on the table in plain sight. A bloody knife was found on a nightstand next to the bed as well, and the knife appeared to have come from the knife set in the kitchen of the home. Yeah, so it looked like there had been no violent struggle or really any disturbance in the room. In spite of the fact that Robert had been stabbed three times, which included one stab wound to the heart, the only blood visible were two small areas on the bed. And these areas of blood were over his shoulder and down his side, so he didn't move at all on the bed. No. Also, which was weird, is that the bed sheet and comforter were folded down neatly at a 45-degree angle. So he was on top of that. He hadn't even gotten under the covers. Yeah. Or if he had, he'd been moved. Right. I wouldn't discount that he had been moved. I mean, just the amount of blood does seem a little small. A little small. For the wounds. You're a doctor. How much blood would you see if someone had been stabbed in the heart? Heart and... There should have been a lot of blood. Yes. Absolutely. That's the point. Right. And and there wasn't. Now, the pillow where Robert's head had rested had a single indentation, as if his head had not moved at all during this whole incident. So the room was oddly neat and not in any disarray. When a blood pattern slash blood spatter expert examined photos from the scene, she concluded that the blood stains and patterns on the bed were completely inconsistent with a violent stabbing. Then on the floor near the bed, evidence technicians found a large white towel with a very small amount of blood on it. There were only a few spots and one slightly bigger area of dry blood on the towel. Later, this blood would be confirmed through DNA testing to be Robert One's blood. Dried blood area measured only 2 to 3 inches in diameter and was examined by the blood pattern blood spatter expert and determined to be inconsistent with having been held to apply pressure to Robert's wounds. Remember, this is what Victor Zaborski said they were doing when he was talking to the 911 operator. Instead, according to the expert, the blood pattern on the towel was consistent with what one would expect to see as someone held the towel in one hand and a bloody knife in the other, placed the knife on the towel, folded the towel over the blade of the knife, and wiped the blood from the towel onto the knife. No. Yeah, I know, it's weird, but that's what it seemed like. So there were areas on the back side of the towel which were consistent with blood having been absorbed through the towel where someone's fingers were applying pressure to the knife. An absence of blood along the edge of the knife's blade was really inconsistent with this knife having been used at all to stab Robert those three times. So the knife was recovered from the nightstand and it was examined by a trace evidence expert and a significant number, more than ten, of white cotton fibers consistent with the white cotton towel were found in some blood on the knife blade. So this suggested that the bloody towel had come into contact with the knife blade. But while the knife used to stab Robert appeared to have passed through his t-shirt in these three separate places, there were no fibers from his t-shirt found in the blood that was on the knife. So how could that be explained? Well, it could be explained that that was not the murder weapon. Sure. That's one thing. But you also have to wonder if he was stabbed through that t-shirt, or if those stabs were made at a different time, and then the shirt was put back on him. Because I just can't imagine if he was stabbed through that shirt, why it wouldn't be soaked in blood, and why there wouldn't be fibers from the shirt on the knife. There should have been. There should have been. So we've gone over the scene and some of the evidence and the lack of evidence. Let's take a few minutes here to talk about Robert and who he was and how he ended up in this house on Swan Street that night. Robert had grown up in Brooklyn as the elder son of William and Alice Wan. The first Wans to come to the U.S. had come to New York in the late 1930s from China. His father was a tech executive at Chase Manhattan Bank and his mother was a librarian. The Wan family lived in a townhouse in Sheepshead Bay. Robert was small, but pretty athletic. He was a Mets fan. 
Robert, his younger brother Andrew, and their father and mother would go to games at Shea Stadium together. Robert volunteered for Chuck Schumer when he was just a 15-year-old. And a couple summers after that, he worked for then-Governor Mario Cuomo. He attended Catholic High School in Brooklyn, did so well that he was named a Monroe Scholar. Uh, he went to college at William and Mary in Virginia and was an excellent student. Now, Joseph Price and Robert Wan had been friends since they both went to college at William and Mary in the 90s. They met when Price gave Robert and his parents their first tour of the campus. Both Joseph and Robert were very interested in politics and student government. Robert, who was three years younger than Joseph, enrolled at William and Mary. Joe Price was his mentor, and they also collaborated on several campus projects. So these guys go back a ways, number one. Yes. And they sound like they were really good friends. They were. Maybe best friends. I mean, they worked a lot together. They did a lot of things. Absolutely they were. Both Price and Robert earned law degrees. Joe Price graduated from the University of Virginia, and Robert got his from the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, these are both pretty top-notch law schools. They were excellent students. So these guys are hot shots. Both ended up at law firms in Washington, D.C. Robert worked at Covington and Burling before he moved on to Radio Free Asia. Still, they remained good friends and part of a really tightly knit group of William and Mary alumni. The two were close, despite taking very different roads in their careers and their personal lives. Price specialized in intellectual property litigation. He also was involved in Equality Virginia, an advocacy group for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. Robert would marry a woman, while Joseph Price, who was openly gay, would be in a committed relationship with Victor Zaborski for many years. Robert met his wife, Catherine Ellen Wu, in January 2002 at an American Bar Association conference in Philadelphia. Catherine was working in Chicago at the time, and at the conference she noticed Robert and thought he was a really good-looking guy. So they, they ended up talking for hours before the conference ended, and then when it did end, they went to dinner together. Then a few weeks after that, Kathy traveled to D.C. It was Valentine's Day, and she and Robert had dinner together. She gave him a photo album filled with photos of Chicago and notes about her favorite places there. He gave her a box of Godiva chocolates. Here's a guy talking, right? I would think she was really putting in more of an effort into these things with photos and notes. <laughs> and he sure. just said, ah, Valentine's must be chocolate time. Well, which is reasonable, really. There's nothing wrong with that. No, I'm just thinking, you know, it seems like she put a lot more thought into it. She did put a lot of thought into it, for sure, yes. But after that dinner, they began a long-distance relationship. Robert called Kathy every night, and they flew back and forth to see each other three times a month. That March, Robert asked her to go with him and his parents on a 30-day trip to China that October. At first, she laughed this off, thinking, well, October is still a long way off anyway. But to me, this shows he was very serious about her. Oh, holy cow. On a 30-day trip? Yeah, yeah. right? With his parents? Yeah, it's got to be major serious. So Kathy had grown up in Vernon Hills, Illinois, about 40 miles outside of Chicago. Her parents and her brother had emigrated to the U.S. from Korea in 1971 when her mother was pregnant with her. Her father worked in a dental lab and her mother was a nurse. Kathy went to public school. She got her undergrad degree from the University of Illinois, and she got a law degree from St. Louis University in 1996. So Kathy did actually accept Robert's invitation to China. When they returned from their trip, Kathy's apartment had a trail of rose petals from the front door to a bouquet of long-stem red roses. And on the dining room table, there was a ring box and a sterling silver fortune cookie. And a note inside the cookie read, Will you marry me? So I'll take back what I said about Robert. He really <laughs> stepped up nicely there. That was a lot of effort. That was yeah. very sweet. So Robert and Kathy were married in June of 2003. Joe Price flew out for the wedding, bringing along his partner, Victor. Now, wasn't Joe his best man? I'm not sure. He may have been. I, they were good friends. I, I read that someplace. That's they, certainly possible. Kathy moved into Robert's apartment in Arlington, and she worked for the Bureau of National Affairs. 
Then, in July of 2004, they bought a townhouse in Oakton. The couple had a very busy social life that revolved a lot around Robert's William and Mary friends. Then their friends began having children, but Kathy had suffered from lupus in high school and her doctors told her that carrying a pregnancy could threaten her life. So what is lupus again? Lupus is one of those horrible autoimmune diseases where the body attacks itself. It seems to occur in young women quite often. It's more common in women than men, more common in African-American women. But yeah, it's a shitty disease. Kidney disease, kidney failure, dialysis, high blood pressure. So how would that threaten a pregnancy or threaten her life if she became pregnant? Well, she's on a bunch of meds. Let's, let's start with that. Okay. Some she's medications med- that may be bad for a fetus? Medications that are not fetal friendly. Okay. So she might have to stop taking them in order to have a baby. Well, she'd have to. Which would put her life on the line. There you go. Okay. Well, that didn't seem to be that huge of a deal because she and Robert did discuss adopting a daughter from China, which, you know, there were many girls from China who did need homes. So that became their long-term plan that they would do that eventually. Right. Now, meanwhile, Joe Price and Victor Zaborski were in a relationship, and they had two sons with a lesbian couple in Silver Spring, Maryland. Price fathered one of the children, and Victor fathered the other. The two renovated a Capitol Hill row house, and they would have friends over for Sunday brunches. The usual attendees for these brunches were the lesbian mothers and their kids, Joe's brother, and Dylan Ward. So we have a new person here, Dylan. And Dylan was a roommate who had become Price's lover and eventually part of a thruple with Price and Zaborski. All three of them, Price, Zaborski, and Dylan Ward, would move from their Capitol Hill house to the townhouse that they bought on Swan Street near DuPont Circle. So in the early summer of 2006, Robert Wong took a position as general counsel at Radio Free Asia. This meant a really big pay cut But Robert was happy there. Money was not his first priority. Radio Free Asia is a U.S. government-funded nonprofit news service that broadcasts radio programs and publishes online news for its audiences in Asia. The service, which provides editorial independent reporting, has the stated mission of providing accurate and uncensored reporting to countries in Asia that have poor media environments and limited protections for freedom of the press and freedom of speech. So after he finished work on August 2, 2006, Robert met with John Lindbergh, a general counsel for Radio Free Europe. They ate dinner together, and they went to a legal seminar. At about 9.30 p.m., Robert went back to his office. On his way there, he spoke with Kathy over the phone. Then, about one hour later, he headed to 1509 Swan Street to stay the night. Robert arrived at the townhouse on Swan Street at about 10.30 p.m. Joe Price, Victor Zaborski, and Dylan Ward were home. What happened in the 79 minutes between Robert's arrival and the 911 call is unknown to anyone except those who were in the house that night. Yeah, both Price and Ward told the police that they welcomed Robert into the kitchen area and they sat around sipping water at the kitchen table. Zaborski told police that he was in his bedroom watching Project Runway. Price and Ward then escorted Robert to the guest room on the second floor. Ward told the police that he went to his room, which is on the same floor, took a sleeping pill, and as he's dozing off, he said he heard Robert taking a shower. Price and Zaborski told the police that they had gone to bed in their bedroom on the third floor. And in the 45 minutes that followed, according to Price, he heard the security system's chimes at the back door. Victor Zaborski said that he heard one low scream followed by another. Then they found Robert mortally wounded on the pull-out bed. The story was that someone had come into the house, stabbed Robert, and left. This didn't explain at all who had cleaned the room washed Robert's body, disposed of bloody towels and sheets, and changed the bedding, all in about 45 minutes' time. So when D.C. police officer Diane Durham arrived on the scene, she said it was Joseph Price who did all of the talking. He gave her a different story than he would give the detectives later. He said that Robert was at the patio door bleeding, so they opened the door and took him upstairs and laid him on the guest bed. 
So that's a totally different story than we're going to hear later. Sure is. So what did we make of that? That he changed the story. Well, they made of it that he's hiding something, of course. What else are you going to make of this? Right. So Kathy won, Robert's wife, got a late night call from Joseph Price. He told her that he couldn't believe he was calling her about this, but she needed to get to George Washington Hospital because Robert had been stabbed. Oh, well, that's something to wake you up with, huh? It's horrible. He was the first person to call Kathy, and this was just a short time after midnight. She didn't know that Robert was dead until after she arrived at the hospital. He was dead on arrival. He was dead in the home, right. yes. Kathy called Robert's close friend Jason T. the next morning and told him that an intruder had killed Robert at Joe Price's house. Now, he was shocked. Kathy had gotten home from the hospital at around 4 a.m. on the 3rd. Robert was buried in a simple wooden casket. Kathy asked Joe Price to be one of the pallbearers. People had sympathy for Joe because his home had been invaded and his friend had been murdered. So Kathy had a receiving line for people to come up to her and offer their condolences. But what's interesting is that Joe had his own receiving line. What's with that? Well, he seems like he was playing the victim. Many people were upset about this. Also, some people were already looking at him with some suspicion. Oh, I'm sure. This story just doesn't work. No, but at this point, most of the people don't know the details. Well, they know that there was an intruder, allegedly, in the house. Yeah, and I think a lot of them believed that in the beginning. Right. Now, after the funeral, one friend of Robert's asked another, well, how did the intruder get into Joe's house? And the second friend looked surprised and answered, oh, there was no intruder. So some people were realizing that this was not right. Something was wrong about this. Yeah, within a short time. Yes, yes. And the police had doubts about this intruder story right from the beginning. Physical evidence just didn't match the stories given by the Holmes residents. No, it's very shaky. So after being taken to the violent crimes branch of the Metropolitan Police Department on the early morning of August 3rd, 2006, Price, Saborski, and Ward were interviewed separately. So Price said that Robert had recently started a new job as general counsel for Radio Free Asia. He was staying late at work on August 2nd so that he could meet the night staff workers there. He had made arrangements to spend the night at Price's Swan Street house, which was close to Robert's new office. Robert had never spent the night there before. He told his wife that he was going to stay there that night uh, just because it was going to be late and he didn't want to disturb her when he got home. And according to Price, Zaborski, and Ward, Robert was exclusively heterosexual and none of the three had ever had any sexual relationship with him. Right. So this was the first time he had ever spent the night there. Right. According to both Price and Zaborski, sometime after they fell asleep, they were woken by a security chime that would ring any time an exterior door of the house was opened. They said that the alarm was not on that night. Price and Zaborski said that they then heard three grunts, and that alarmed them. So they left their bedroom then, went down to the second floor, and walked directly into the guest room where Robert was. Now, they didn't explain why they didn't stop at Dylan Ward's room, which would have been closer. So, for some reason, they knew to go to that front room. This is when they reportedly saw that Robert had been stabbed. The two men said that they then saw Dylan Ward come out of his second floor bedroom for the first time that night. So, up until that time, they hadn't seen him. Right. Not since he'd gone to bed. And we've got a little bit of a change. I don't know who said that they'd heard a a low-pitched scream, and now it's grunts. Yes, and that changes three or four times. Yeah. All three men reported seeing no one else in the house at the time. They didn't hear anyone running on the uncarpeted wood-floored hallway or the stairs either. And this was, you know, a nice home, but a very old home. So the stairs were very creaky. Nothing in the house appeared out of order, and they didn't hear any more door chimes. But in all of their interviews, they suggested that the killer must have been an unknown and unseen intruder, which there was just no evidence to support that. No, but they're sticking to that story. Absolutely they are. In Zaborski's statement to police, he said that he had come home early from a business trip and learned that Robert would be spending the night there. He said that he had not seen Robert when he arrived because he had already been in bed. 
Zaborski said that he and Price were sleeping in their third floor bedroom when he heard a low kind of scream and low breathy grunts. He said that he and Joe Price jumped out of bed and then they heard another low scream while they were in their doorway. Zaborski said that he had not heard anyone fleeing the room or the house. He admitted that he would have expected to hear it if someone had run down the wooden steps to the first floor. And Zaborski told detectives that around that time he became hysterical. Which seems, that seems kind of believable when you're listening to that 911 call. Oh, it does. Price told him to call 911, so he did. And the 911 operator, as you've heard, told Zaborski to get a towel and apply pressure to the wound. So he gave Price a towel. Zaborski then said that Price had asked what time it was. So he asked the operator. He said she told him it was 11.43. But the recording from the 911 call, you can clearly hear her say that it's 11.54. Right. So you wonder, is he trying to make it seem sooner? Are they trying to close in that time frame a little bit? Yeah, I think maybe they're trying to tighten up the story a little. Exactly. That's what I mean by close in. Tighten up. That's a good way to put it. Zaborski said that when Price found Robert's body, Zaborski began to scream. He didn't see Ward at the time, he said. He claimed that when he first saw Ward, he was on the phone with the 911 operator and saw Ward on the stairs. At the time, Ward asked him, Is the back door open? In Ward's statement to the police, he said that Robert was Joe Price's college friend who had never spent the night there before. At one point in his interview... When asked what happened after Robert first arrived, Ward said, and here I'm going to give you a little quote, Nothing. We talked about his wife. We talked about our friend Lisa. We talked briefly about his job. It was just chit-chat. And that's the end of the quote. He said that they took Robert upstairs and they showed him the bed. And then Ward went to bed, read for about five minutes, and took a sleeping pill before he fell asleep. Ward said he did hear Robert taking a shower and then heard his bedroom door close. Ward claimed that he heard a commotion, put on his robe, and left his bedroom, and when he emerged from his bedroom, Zaborski was on the phone with 911. Joe Price was in his underwear sitting next to Robert. He also claimed to see a square of cloth being pressed on Robert's chest. Ward said he didn't see a knife, but that Price told him that he had moved the knife. Yeah, now Joe Price said that he and Zaborski had gone to bed, And sometime after that, he heard the door chime. According to Price, he told Zaborski to go upstairs and call 911. This is when they discovered Robert's body. There was a phone right there in the guest room, so I'm not sure why Price told Zaborski to go upstairs. Price said that he remembered the knife had been lying on Robert's stomach and that he had picked it up and placed it on the nightstand. But then immediately after his police interview... Price told a friend that he had actually pulled the knife out of Robert's chest before putting it on the nightstand. He said that he had then raised Robert's t-shirt and noticed a stab wound to his abdomen and a lot of blood on his chest. So where did that blood go? So we don't know where that blood went. That's one of the biggest things to me about this story. So they're talking about all this blood, 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 blood. And when EMS responders and police come by, there's not anywhere near the amount of blood described by these guys. No, no, I know. Now, Price told detectives that he knew Zaborski and Ward better than he knew his own mother, and there was no chance that either of them had hurt Robert. According to Price, when he found Robert, he lifted the t-shirt and saw blood everywhere. Price told the police that his fingerprints or DNA might be on the knife because he had picked it up. He added that, you know, the police might not find the real killer's DNA on the knife, because the real killer may have been wearing a glove. Good comment. So why did he feel like he needed to tell the police that? Well, I get the impression that he's kind of a know-it-all anyway. Well, sure, that's true. Interviews with several witnesses who knew the three men well confirmed that the three men were in a romantic three-way relationship. Price and Zaborski had an intimate relationship, and they shared a bedroom. Ward had his own bedroom on the second floor, and he was in an intimate relationship with Price only. So this relationship included a dominant-submissive sexual relationship with Ward in the dominant role and Price in the submissive role. This had also been captured in multiple photos that would be recovered from Price's computer. The investigation would show that Robert was heterosexual, 
happily married, and had no sexual or intimate relationship with the other three men. So the police got search warrants for one 509 Swan Street the mm -hmm. day after the murder. FBI forensic experts gathered boxes of evidence, which included pieces of the walls and the staircase. They went after this house, didn't they? Yeah, they were really looking for evidence. In Dylan Ward's bedroom, the police found a cutlery set box inside of a cabinet. It was designed to hold three things, a large carving knife, a large fork, and a smaller knife. Now, the large knife and fork were still there. Smaller knife was missing. Police obtained a duplicate of the smaller knife from the manufacturer, and its blade measured four and a half inches. The missing knife is never found, but that missing knife, based on its blade, was more consistent with the depth of the stab wounds than the knife that had been found on the nightstand in the guest room. So here's another little quandary, right? We've got a, a knife on the nightstand with blood that's probably not the murder weapon. Right. It's not uh, consistent with it. Very interesting. I'd like to take a quick moment here to tell you all about our True Crime Brewery premium show. You can subscribe on our website, tiegrabber.com, for $4 a month to get all of our shows without commercials, get bonus episodes, and get all of the episodes one day early. By subscribing and getting these benefits, you'll also be supporting the show and helping us to create more content. So if this sounds like it's for you, we would really appreciate your support. We also have a Patreon page which offers the same benefits, and you can access that by going to patreon.com forward slash tiegrabber. Examination of the house showed no sign of forced entry. House had locks on the front and back doors. It had a seven-foot-high security fence and a locked security gate around the small backyard. There is also a separate rear entrance for a basement apartment. There is no property missing from the home. On August 3rd, medical examiner Lois Goslinowski performed the autopsy on Robert Wan's body. She found three exceptionally clean, symmetrical, and uniform stab wounds to his torso. There were no defects in the wounds, no drag marks, and no abrasions. The wounds were described as perfect, slit-like defects. Each had been inflicted at the exact same angle. The doctor described them as methodically inflicted. The doctor also found a single petechial hemorrhage in the right sclera, the white of the eye, and a single petechial hemorrhage in the left lower conjunctiva, the inner surface of the eyelid and the exposed surface of the eyeball. These findings were consistent with an asphyxia event, like an attempt to suffocate him with a pillow, but there were no signs of manual strangulation. His hyoid bone was intact, and there were no ligature marks or bruising on Robert's neck. Now, the first stab wound to Robert's chest was located at the central upper chest, 15 inches below the top of his head. It was 7 eighths of an inch long. The wound extended through the chest wall with perforations of the bone of the sternum where it meets the third rib, and then continued with perforation of the pericardial sac, that's uh, kind of the lining around the heart, and penetrating into the heart at the root of the aorta, the left anterior descending coronary artery, and the left atrial appendage. The wound was four to five inches deep. Now that's going to kill you. Yes. You got the heart. Mm-hmm. Okay, now we got the second stab wound. It was on the right side of the chest, and it entered the right lung. It, too, was four to five inches deep. Then the third wound was located at the central epigastric region of the abdomen. So that's right below the rib cage right in the middle. That's the epigastrium. This wound perforated the small intestine and the pancreas, and it also gave a, a single perforation of the inferior vena cava, which is the big, huge vessel that carries blood back to the heart. Now, this was also four to five inches deep, and according to the medical examiner, the stab wounds damaged major vascular areas and organs and resulted in a large quantity of blood loss which is certainly in excess of what had been found on the guest bed. Well, it had to be. I mean, you, you've cut a heart, coronary arteries, right by the aorta. Holy cow. 
It's all very vascular, to say the least. Very vascular. Vena cava, yeah. I mean, it's going to bleed a lot. Yes. Now, Dr. Goslinowski also found several needle punctures on Robert's body. This is fascinating. This is very interesting here. He had multiple needle punctures on the left side of his neck. He had three needle punctures to the center of his chest, two needle punctures on the top of his right foot, and one more needle puncture on the back of his left hand. So after reviewing medical records, interviewing re EMS responders and medical professionals who attempted to revive Robert in the hospital, showed that most of the puncture wounds, especially the ones in the center of the chest, were not caused by medical treatment or interventions. Well, I, I could see that the ones on the hand and the feet, those are probably from attempts to start an IV. They could be, yes. But I don't know. Medical personnel would not be puncturing the neck with needles or the chest. No, they did concede that it's possible they could have punctured the neck, but very unlikely. That's the tough one. Yeah. I could maybe even see the center of the chest if you're at the point where you're trying to inject epinephrine into the heart to get it started. Yeah, that still seems kind of unusual. Yeah, yeah, it is. But they certainly were not responsible for all of these punctures. No, they weren't. Because, additionally, the MA did determine that the needle puncture marks were made pre-mortem before death. And according to responders, Robert was already dead when they got there. Further, Robert had not had any medical appointments or lab work done in the weeks leading up to August 2nd and his wife Kathy had not seen any needle puncture marks on his body before August 2nd. Also, according to the medical examiner, the knife wounds themselves would not have killed or rendered Robert unconscious, immediately anyway. So unless he was otherwise incapacitated, he would have reacted instinctively to protect himself. Well, yeah, that's just common sense. Nobody just right. lies there as they're being stabbed. Go ahead, stab me a couple of times. It wouldn't times. be possible even if you wanted to. Your body would respond. Yeah, but there were no defensive wounds on his hands or his arms. There had been internal bleeding from the stab wounds. In fact, blood had filled Robert's intestine for a couple feet of intestine. So this means that Robert was alive for a short period of time after he was stabbed because his digestive system had continued to operate and force blood into his intestine. Robert's cause of death was ruled to be stab wounds, and the manner of death was ruled a homicide. Standard toxicology tests were done on samples taken from Robert. Those tests screened for only the following drugs, ethanol, acetone, methanol, isopropanol, amphetamines, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, cocaine metabolites, methadone, methamphetamines, opiates, fencyclidine, propoxyphene, and carbon monoxide, and all of these were negative. So... There are paralytic drugs or incapacitating drugs that were not tested for because the stories of the three men gave no indication that any of these had been used. Yeah, but the incapacitating and paralytic drugs are not street drugs. They're not something that someone would use. Yeah, one of those is succinylcholine, and that cannot always be found at autopsy. But when used in an uncontrolled environment, the drug causes paralysis of the entire body which includes the lungs. So you, you basically can't breathe and you die unless you get an antidote or get breathed for it till it wears off. So the thing that makes it tricky for examiners is that the human body breaks succinylcholine down pretty quickly into compounds that are normally found in the body. So there's no trace of injection. Now, the only drug found in the home on Swan Street was ecstasy. Which the men had already said that they had used. They had admitted to that. And now you're going to get into some other really strange stuff. It takes a dark turn, for sure. So Dr. Goslinowski collected samples from Robert using a standard sex kit protocol. Two swabs were taken from his thighs and his external genitalia, two anal swabs, two anal rectal swabs, and two swabs from his mouth or lip area. Now, at the FBI DNA lab, semen was detected on all of the swabs except for the mouth and lip swabs. And DNA testing found there was no foreign DNA on any of the swabs. So all of the semen found on all of those swabs was Robert's. Well, well. Dr. So Goslinowski 
had the opinion that after taking all evidence and circumstances into consideration, the findings certainly suggested that Robert had been sexually assaulted. Yeah. I don't know how his semen could have gotten there. In her summary, the doctor wrote that Robert had been alive but incapacitated at the time his stab wounds were inflicted. Even if he had been physically restrained, he would have had indications of defensive wounds, blood on his hands, and defects to his stab wounds. The wounds and internal bleeding would have been so painful that it would have been virtually impossible for him to refrain from moving or trying to get out of bed. And I think anyone could say that. You don't need to be a doctor to realize that. (laughs) I wouldn't think. So what about the delayed reporting? Price, Zaborski, and Ward all appeared freshly showered when the police arrived at the scene. Also, only Joe wanted to do all of the talking. The next-door neighbor told police that she heard a scream between 11 p.m. and 11.30 p.m., but Zaborski didn't call 911 until 11.49 p.m. Yeah, now police ruled out the intruder theory, because under this theory, the intruder took a knife from the kitchen butcher block. He then climbed 16 wooden, uncarpeted steps without being heard by anyone, which is nearly impossible. It was a loud stairway. Once he reached the second floor, the intruder would have been right in front of Dylan Ward's closed bedroom door. But rather than enter that room, the intruder walked another 20 feet or so to another closed door, which was the guest room, went into that room, stabbed Robert three separate times, all the while Robert did not move or try to defend himself. And then with no blood spatter on the bed or anywhere else in the room, Killer would then have left the knife either on or in Robert's chest. The intruder didn't take Robert's wallet, Blackberry, or expensive watch. Then the intruder would have had to go back down the stairs, through the back door, and get over the security fence without being heard. Even the residents of the home would eventually acknowledge that the intruder theory was implausible, and it just didn't make sense. Well, Robert's wife, Kathy, had been under the impression that Robert had been killed by an intruder. But when detectives came to her house and talked to her, they were asking questions about Robert's relationship with Joe and the other two men. This is when Kathy realized that the police didn't believe that he had been killed by an intruder at all. She and many of Robert's closest friends had been under the impression that Robert had been a victim of a random crime. But now the detectives had suspicions that his friends were somehow involved in killing him. That's got to be quite a blow. It was a big blow because these were Kathy's friends as well. At least Joe was. And, And Joe was a very good friend. She thought so. So one night, Joe called Robert and Kathy's friend and attorney, Jason T., who'd been spending a lot of time with Kathy helping her out. Joe asked Jason to waive privilege and tell him what the detectives had asked Kathy. Joe Price's question was Kathy's first indication that Joe had something he needed to protect. So it really began to seem like Joe, Victor, and Dylan were hiding something. The crime scene just didn't make any sense at all. No, and that's, you know... Asking an attorney to waive privilege, that's a serious issue. Yes. Joe Price, Victor Zaborski, and Dylan Ward then showed up at Kathy's house, and they insisted on having a private meeting with Kathy down in her basement. So at this point, she still believed their story and continued to see all of these men as victims. But other friends were really put off and concerned with their behavior. It really seemed odd to interrogate the widow of your good friend after his death. Also, all three men had already hired defense attorneys, and this was very early on in the investigation. Yeah, well, I would have done that too. Yes, I can see that, and they're attorneys, so I understand that to a point, but I don't really understand what they're doing with Kathy here. Yeah, that's, uh, they've got some scheme that they're trying to work on her, I think. Well, it's really starting to seem like they're trying to protect their own interests. Well, of course, they've been doing that from the start. Yes, which doesn't seem right when this was supposed to be Joe's, you know, pretty much best friend, at least one of his best friends. Right. So Joe Price had contacted Bernie Grimm, a really well-respected defense attorney, shortly after Robert's murder. He had done a lot of research, he said, and Grimm had an excellent reputation. So according to Grimm, Joe said to him, you're a street fighter and that's what I need. 
Grimm told Joe right from the beginning that he didn't want to hear any spin, just the facts. And Joe Price, in his mind, was factually innocent. Now, because Price, Zaborski, and Ward were all gay, Grimm believed that the police were against them because they were all homophobic. And also, because they were in a three-way relationship, the police looked at them as freaks. But according to the detectives, their homophobic remarks were a tool to try and anger the suspects and get confessions. You know, kind of the old good cop, bad cop routine. They said things like, well, why is a straight guy going to a house with three homosexuals? And the suggestion was that either Robert was wanting to experiment with homosexual acts or the three men had planned to sexually assault him and things got out of hand. So if you're thinking that maybe Robert did want to experiment with some homosexual acts, it's possible, but that really doesn't explain the scene. Uh, For one thing, Robert had his mouth guards in, and I don't think he'd keep those in if he was planning to do something sexual. And also, he had been incapacitated. Well, that's a conclusion. That's not a known fact. That he had been incapacitated? Yeah. Oh, there's so much evidence proving that to me. You've got the needle marks, but it's not just that. How would someone lie still to be stabbed? Well, that's the main thing. Yeah, and the lack of blood. Even if he was cleaned up, the stab wound still shouldn't have been that neat if he was awake or even asleep and woke up by them, right? Right. There there would have been a response. So Grimm said that the detectives had tunnel vision and never really investigated the intruder theory at all. But prosecutors did look at the backyard and found that the fence was covered with undisturbed spider webs. Then in the kitchen, instead of taking the large knife from the butcher block, the intruder takes this smaller steak knife And then he walks past the expensive electronic equipment, climbs the loud wooden staircase, walks past Dylan Ward's room, and enters the guest room. But then the intruder doesn't even go directly to Robert. What he did, what he would have had to have done, was walk around the bed, pass Robert's wallet, watch, and Blackberry, and then stab Robert three times. Then when he leaves, unseen and unheard, he would have to scale the fence out back again, instead of just simply leaving through the front door, which would make more sense if you're in a hurry to leave. Yeah, no, I think we've uh, taken care of the intruder theory. Well, you might think so, but when we get to a trial, the defense is definitely going to go with the intruder theory. Well, they have to. (laughs) Yeah. There's, There's three defendants in the house with the murdered person, and so if none of them did it, it has to be an intruder. So, yeah, they they don't have anything else to work with. That's true. So the accepted timeline between when Robert arrived at the house and Zaborski called 911 is 79 minutes. Now, police did a door-to-door canvas of the neighborhood the day after the murder. These are all row houses, so neighbors are right on the other side of the wall, and some walls are thinner than others. Now, directly next door to 1509 Swan Street, there was an older couple who routinely watched the news every night. And these neighbors told detectives that between 11 and 11.30, they heard a scream. They were the only people who claimed to have heard the scream. Now remember, Saborski didn't call 911 until 11.49. So the, the residents of the house waited between 19 and 49 minutes after a scream to pick up the phone and call for help. And it's suspicious that Victor Zaborski asked what time it is right in the middle of trying to save Robert's life. This is while there may have been an intruder in the house who was holding one of their knives. And why did he say he has one of our knives, when there was clearly a knife sitting on the bedside table? Well, he hadn't been to the kitchen to see that a knife was missing from the butcher block. Right. So, yeah, it doesn't make sense why he was so sure that the intruder had one of their knives. It doesn't, does it? No. It seems like the three men talked about the intruder story before... Victor Zaborski even made the 911 call. Well, they'd have to. And I think maybe Victor Zaborski came across Dylan Ward hurting Robert, and maybe it was Victor who screamed. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. You're paralyzed with succinylcholine. You can't scream. No, it would have been Victor that screamed. Right. Right. So it wasn't Robert. It wasn't the victim screaming. Unless he screamed when he was getting the injection. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a needle prick. I'd I'd be more likely to say, hey, um, whatever. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yes. And Victor seemed like he was the one who was more emotional. Oh, he definitely was. In the 911 call, he comes across as very emotional. So 
You know, then they had up to 49 minutes for the three of them to come up with a story. Also, time to manipulate the scene and put together a story. So that seems like evidence of a cover-up right there. Sure does. So 72 hours after police first arrived on the scene, detectives searched the home and they found hundreds of sexual devices in Dylan Ward's room. This was an extensive collection of shackles, whips, chains, dildos, and a bunch of other items. There is a device that looked like a gas mask with a lock on the back of it. There were torture devices too, like nipple clamps and mouth gags. One item was for electrically stimulating the prostate to force an ejaculation. This is a something called an Eros, E-R-O-S, Tech Electrostimulator. So this certainly could explain why Robert's own semen had been found in his rectum. Well, yeah, I think his semen being found in his rectum means that something happened to him. That's yeah. not normal. So... That's very curious. Yeah, it is. He, he can't have sex with himself, can he? No. So you have to wonder if some kind of device was used and he did ejaculate, and then another device was used in his rectum, which left his own semen in there. Or the killer could have forced the ejaculation and put it on himself and then penetrated Robert's rectum with his penis Yep. that had Robert's semen on it. Yes, but I think he would have had to be wearing a condom because no one else's DNA was found. Right. Yeah, but yeah, that's definitely possible. So you have to wonder how the semen got inside of him. But you know what also is interesting and was pointed out by defense attorneys is that none of Robert's DNA was found on any of Dylan Ward's sex toys. Although that too could be explained by the cleanup. Yeah, well, cleanup or I mean, he had an extensive collection according to the notes. Yes. So... They just threw out the ones that were used. Yeah, they could have gotten rid of them, yes. Just like they could have gotten rid of the knife. Yeah. So that's when they searched the computers and they found the photos of Joe Price and Dylan Ward in these bondage situations. Ward was the dominant one and Price was the submissive. So could that have been taken to the next level? The prosecutors had to contemplate. Maybe Ward killed Robert and Price had to keep quiet as part of being submissive. Of course, they just didn't know, but they did know that Ward and Price did some really extreme things with each other, which included inflicting pain and caging and confining Joe Price as well. Now, certainly something like this could prejudice detectives against them, but also it could be significant as evidence. Oh, sure. I think that goes both ways. Yeah. Now, there's also a copy of the New Yorker magazine in Ward's room. This issue had a sketch of Shakespeare on his deathbed, and this was a very similar position to Robert's position when he was found. Now, that's a bit of a stretch to me, but there could be possibly a connection there. I don't know. Well, I don't know either. That's what I'm saying. The rape kit only showed Robert's own semen. So how would his semen get into his own rectum without a sexual assault? Right. I mean, really, an intruder could not have come into the home, drugged and sexually assaulted Robert. How did he get a hold of the items? Did he bring his own? And if so, why didn't he bring his own knife? And then kill Robert, and all this would happen while the other three men heard nothing. Yeah, it's a tough one. It is a tough one. About one week into the investigation, detectives began to focus on finding out about the missing blood. They wanted to be able to prove that the blood had been cleaned up. So police considered if Robert may have been stabbed in a different location than where he had been found. Then maybe he was cleaned up and placed in the guest bed. The scene did absolutely seem staged. A canine crew came in to alert on blood or decomposition, and they hit on the lint trap of the dryer, which could show that something with blood may have been washed and dried there. A dog also alerted on the rear stairway drain, but they couldn't find any concrete evidence there. So once blood goes down into the drain and mixes with water, it's unlikely that there's enough of a sample to create a DNA profile from. But no cleaning products were found in the home to support the cleanup scenario either. Police searched extensively. Then they messed up. They used Ashley's reagent, which is a chemical used to search for latent blood. So these chemicals were sprayed throughout the home, and at first it looked like blood was found all over the place. But then they found out that mistakes were made and the whole thing was botched. They had not followed directions. And this Ashley's reagent is not supposed to be applied to vertical surfaces. 
because it'll drip down and then just obliterate any blood stains. But not knowing that, the police had sprayed it on the walls. So if it had been applied correctly, they may have found blood in the house, but once this mistake was made, it was really too late. After the sexual assault angle didn't help with the investigation and no blood was found, investigators followed an investigative path involved in the knife. Right, the knife had been sent to the lab for analysis, and once the forensics came in, no DNA or fingerprints were found on it. But they did learn that the knife did not match the wounds on Robert, because the blade was five and a half inches long, but the wounds were all between four and a half and five inches deep. So how could someone stab a victim three times, making sure that they didn't insert the knife the entire length of the blade? Also, there were the white fibers from the towel on the knife, but no gray fibers from Robert's t-shirt. So the conclusion was that it was not the knife that had killed Robert, that this knife had been planted, and the knife that was missing from Dylan Ward's bedroom was likely the actual murder weapon, because that knife had a shorter blade that was more consistent with Robert's wounds, and that knife was never recovered. And three months after the murder... When the three men who were no longer living at 1509 Swan Street, the home was burglarized. Now, the burglary was reported by Dylan Ward's attorney, and it turned out that Joe Price's brother, Michael, had taken the flat-screen TVs and pawned them. And that's when police learned that Michael Price had a key to the home. Back when he was interviewed by the police, Joe Price had said the only other person with a key was a contractor who had done work on the place. He didn't tell them that Michael had a key. Why not? Yeah, good question. Then the police learned that Michael Price had been taking classes at night to become a phlebotomist. Well, this really rang some bells, right? Because of the needle punctures. Right. And Michael Price had access to Holy Cross Hospital, where there was a possibility he could have gotten a hold of some succinylcholine. Yeah, now in the documentary, it stated that he would have easy access, but I don't agree because, you know, that's held under lock and key. If you're an anesthesiologist, sure, you'd have easy access. But a phlebotomist, not so much. But still, I think it's possible working in a hospital to get some. Sure. I think if you just say he worked in a hospital and there's a possibility of access, maybe he could have gotten some. Sure. But no, typically he's not going to come near, near it. It's not going to be one of his tools of the trade at all. Not at all. No. But even more curiously, it's very striking to me that on August 2nd, Michael had not shown up for his phlebotomy class. And it's not like he just didn't show up sometimes. This was the first class he ever missed, was on the night that Robert was killed. So where was Michael on the night of the murder? His phone was tracked and determined that his phone was nowhere near the 1509 Swan Street address, but we know that people do turn off their phones or leave them behind when they go to commit a crime. But all this is just speculation. Yeah, plus Michael had an alibi. He was with his partner on the night of Robert's death. Still need to investigate that stuff, huh? right? Well, yeah, I don't think that your partner is necessarily the best alibi. No. That's someone who might lie for you. So if Michael Price, Joe Price, Victor Zaborski, or Dylan Ward were the killer, all of the men had a motive to cover it up. They certainly did. So a whole year went by with no new information released to the public and no arrests being made. Robert's wife, Kathy, then went to her husband's former law partners at Covington and Burling. Eric Holder, who had been the U.S. attorney in D.C., was now the head of the practice. A news conference was held and Holder asked the people who had been in 1509 Swan Street when Robert was killed to ask themselves if they provided the police with all of the information relevant to the investigation of the crime. Kathy then spoke to the individual who had taken Robert's life, and she said that having a murder on your conscience is no small load to carry, and wanted them to come forward. Now, after the murder occurred, it seemed that Kathy wanted to believe the story that was told by Price, Zaborski, and Ward. 
But by the time of that press conference, she is no longer giving them the benefit of the doubt. She now believed that they were hiding something. How could you not, really? Yeah, I mean, if they're completely innocent, why aren't they speaking out? Exactly. So Price, Zaborski, and Ward stayed together, but they sold the Swan Street house and they all moved to Florida. And they showed no interest to talking about the case, even with Kathy, who had been their friend. Yeah, but still the police didn't have enough to make an arrest. They did have quite a bit of circumstantial evidence. They knew that someone had killed Robert, and there was no indication that someone other than the three people in the house could have done it. They refused to provide any evidence or to discuss the crime anymore, so the absence of that evidence was identified as evidence of a cover-up by the three men. So two years after the murder, prosecutors couldn't bring a murder charge, but they did believe that they could prove the three men were part of a conspiracy to obstruct justice. To seek an arrest warrant for obstruction without knowing who had killed the victim was really unprecedented, but the judge agreed that they had probable cause and authorized an arrest. With the three possible co-conspirators, the prosecution needed to find the weakest link in the group. So they arrested Dylan Ward first. When he was picked up in Florida, he was interrogated. The strategy was to get him away from the other two, to get him away from the other two men and get him to tell the real story. But Ward said what he'd said on the night of the murder was what really happened. He didn't break. So as soon as he was taken to court, Price and Zaborski were indicted too. Police had the same conversation with Zaborski and Price, but no one broke. So the three men were charged with obstruction of justice, conspiracy to obstruct justice, and tampering with physical evidence. Robert was killed August 2, 2006, but it wasn't until October 27, 2008 that the affidavit came out. And it was a shocking document. Prosecutors and the police made it public to stir the pot and try to elicit any reactions or confessions. Robert and Kathy's friend, Jason T., had gone back and forth about whether or not to believe Price, Zaborski, and Ward. But after the affidavit came out, He, too, is convinced that they were responsible for Robert's murder. Yet Kathy saw the information as a betrayal by Price, who she now believed knew more than he was saying and could actually have killed Robert. Up until that affidavit was made public, the intruder theory was plausible to most people because they didn't know any better. But after reading it, people were very conflicted. After that, the gay community was not so supportive of Joe Price, who'd been a really respected leader in gay and trans rights issues. Bloggers on the case had a good friend who ran in the same circles as Price and the other men. And this friend said that it had not been a three-way relationship. It had been two two two-way relationships. And that dynamic had set up what probably happened on the night Robert was killed. But again, this is all speculation. Price, Saborski, and Ward hired a well-known defense team, which included Bernie Grimm known as one of the best defense attorneys in Washington. Each of the men had to have their own attorney, but the three attorneys put together a joint defense. They filed motions to have the sexual device and any mention of sexual misconduct suppressed as evidence. I think it's devices, if you want to just do that over. They filed motions to have sexual devices and any mention of sexual misconduct suppressed as evidence. The prosecution objected, but they lost. So the semen and the S&M devices were all tossed out. And I think this was a pretty big blow to the prosecution. Well, I think they need that. I mean, the whole sexual aspect was part of the motive. Yeah, the defense filed for and got a bench trial. So instead of convincing 12 people, now they only had to convince the judge. Now, this was a high-profile case, and each man could get up to 38 years in prison if convicted. A scale model of the home was constructed for the trial. Yeah, the defense's investigator had learned that someone could put their hand through the front door mail slot and unlock the front door. They also had a video of one of the defense attorneys vaulting over the back fence, and it didn't look that difficult. The housekeeper from next door told the defense that she had told the police the day after the murder that she had evidence that someone had jumped the fence, but she said that police told her not to worry about it. Evidence is a strong way to put it. What she said is there was a dent in a plastic children's toy, like one of those, looked like one of those sandboxes with a cover on it, like a turtle, and it was dented in as if someone had jumped on it. 
So whether you could call that evidence or not, it was something to consider. The defense was certainly happy to hear about it. The prosecution had the medical examiner take the stand, and she testified that about one-third of Robert's blood volume was left in him. So where was the other two-thirds? But then Dr. Henry Lee testified for the defense and said that Robert had bled out internally and all of the blood had remained in his body. Lee tried to say that Robert died almost instantly from the stab wound to his heart. Now the first one on the scene, an EMS worker, said that Robert's torso did appear to be completely wiped clean, however. Then at trial, the prosecutor gave the information about the planted knife not being the murder weapon, but Dr. Lee testified to the opposite. Lee said that the pattern on the knife was not from a towel, but from the knife being plunged into Robert's body repeatedly. The prosecutor had testimony about the length of the knife being too long and about the missing knife from Ward's knife set being the correct length. Prosecution claimed that Dylan or someone else used the knife to kill Robert and then discarded it. Yeah, I don't know about this, Henry Lee. I'm kind of feeling like he's paid to say whatever you want him to say in some ways. I mean, I don't want to go that far and totally say that he's unethical. But I do think if you hire him for your defense, he's going to say what you need him to say, at least to a certain point. Well, it's like all expert witnesses. Well, yeah. I mean, we saw Henry Lee back in one of the original cases we covered, right? The Peterson, the Catherine Peterson murder trial. Yep. Yeah, and he was pretty convincing for the defense in that one as well. That he was. But what also hurt the prosecutor was that the defense had Dylan Ward's mother testify, and she said that she had mailed the cutlery set to Dylan, and the one knife that was missing, the proposed murder weapon, had been kept by her from the beginning. It hadn't been sent to him. So this was a big surprise. But on the other hand, do we really believe a mother? Because she's probably trying to defend her child. Most mothers would. So where is the knife? I mean, she says she kept it. She said she kept it. I don't know if she ever had to actually show it. Yeah, she'd have to. Would she have to? I don't know. Well, if if the investigators found out about it. Well, sure, but she could say she kept it and she doesn't know where it is. Sure. Or even if she did show it, how do we know it's the same one? We don't. We don't. So to me, it's not that strong, but it did seem to really mean something to the judge. Another problem with the prosecutor's case was that they couldn't prove which one of these men covered up evidence and which one of these men had actually killed Robert. It was impossible to prove if one of them did it, two of them did it, or all three of them did it. So how do you get a conviction on that? Well, the charges are just obstruction of justice. Well, sure, but how are you going to prove that all three of them or just one of them did that? You're not. So it's really hard to convict them. Well, obviously. Yeah. Because the judge deliberated one week and returned with a verdict. She took the bench on June 29, 2010, and read through her verdict, a 38-page document. She said that she was convinced that Robert had not been killed by an intruder. The essential question remained whether the evidence proved beyond a reasonable doubt as to any defendant knew sufficient information about the murder. So she could not conclude there was obstruction of justice because she couldn't conclude specific account. Which means she couldn't have said which man. Right. As you said. Yeah. She said that some of the most persuasive evidence supporting the government's position is that each of the men displayed a demeanor at odds with what anyone would expect from an innocent person whose friend had just been murdered. Yeah, the judge really shredded the character of these three defendants, and for a while the defense thought that they had lost. She talked about the 911 call and the interviews with police, saying that Zaborski was histrionic and tearful, but that his words and demeanor on the 911 call were at best odd and eyebrow-raising, and at worst, calculated. She said that Joe Price was consistently arrogant, unconcerned, and dismissive. And, she said, Mr. Ward was distant and detached right from the start. So she really did sound like she would find them all guilty. But the judge concluded that the murder weapon was the knife found on the nightstand. So she didn't believe that the knife had been planted. She said that she believed that Price had likely pulled the weapon from Robert's chest and wiped the blade and the handle of the knife. She couldn't say, however, that he had done it to obstruct justice. She concluded that the government's evidence didn't prove that the defendant's timelines were false. She didn't believe that they had cleaned up blood, 
and delayed calling 911. So she found all three of them not guilty. The judge even did acknowledge that the men had withheld information, but she differentiated between the moral certainty and the evidential certainty. So there wasn't proof beyond a reasonable doubt, in other words. At the end of the trial, Kathy Wan and the rest of Robert's family left immediately, and Kathy was in tears. None of them felt that they had any justice for Robert's murder. Defense attorney Grimm told reporters that he believes Joe Price, his client, is innocent. And if he had to choose what had happened, he admitted, he would say that his best guess is that Dylan Ward killed Robert Wan. So I was pretty, um, I found that striking. No kidding. This is a defense attorney. Yes. All right. Kathy Wan filed a wrongful death civil suit against the three men, and this was settled out of court. Whatever money was awarded to Kathy Wan was given to a charitable trust. She begged all three of them to answer questions about what happened that night, but all three took the fifth. They even took the fifth when asked, did you kill Robert? Right. So in a civil suit, you do the deposition before the trial begins. And in their depositions, they all took the fifth. And then it seems like they just wanted to pay her and be done with it. It almost seems like they paid their way out of this. As to me. So now, over 16 years after Robert's murder, it angers a lot of people to think that Joe Price, Victor Zaborski, and Dylan Ward do know what happened to Robert, but they chose to remain silent anyway. I mean, if nothing else, it's disrespectful to someone who had been Joe Price's good friend for many years. It seems like the men abdicated their responsibility to Robert. So the homicide case remains open, so there is still some hope that someone will come forward one day. And of course, there's no statute of limitations on murder. That's right. So Joe Price and Victor Zaborski still live together in Florida. Dylan left the relationship, and he is married. Both Joe and Dylan have changed their names. In 2011, family and friends gathered at Barksdale Field at the College of William and Mary, to dedicate two benches and two trees in Robert's memory. The plaques on the benches read, Rest a while and enjoy the wonderful world around you, which is a reference to one of Robert's favorite songs by Louis Armstrong. What a wonderful world. You know, Robert just seemed like such a great person. It's heartbreaking. He does seem like a guy. <laughs> a good well, he, guy. Yeah, you know, he left a law firm where he was, could probably, you know, become a partner and be rich to do something that he felt was more important and to get less money. He'd actually said to his wife when he took that job, you know, I don't need to drive a Mercedes or a BMW. I can drive my Toyota. So that warms my heart. I think we lost a really good person. If you have any information that could help solve this case, there is a number to call. It's 202-727-9099. So before we get to feedback, I just want to remind everyone to go to tigrabber.com slash subscribe if you're interested in getting early bonus and ad-free episodes of True Crime Brewery. Or if you prefer, you can get these same benefits at patreon.com forward slash tigrabber. Also, a quick reminder that you can send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com or leave us a voicemail from your phone, computer, or device by clicking on the link in our show notes or by going to our website, tiegrabber.com, and clicking on Leave a Voicemail. Also, you could help out the show by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to us. However you support us, we do appreciate you and thank you for spending your time here with us at The Quiet End. It's time for listener feedback. So on to feedback. Now the first voicemail is from Courtney, and she has a case suggestion. Hi, Dick and Jill. Brand new listener here. I just finished your video on Elaine O'Hara. And thank you so much for really going in depth for that case. I have never been able to find any other YouTuber or podcaster that went into that much detail about that specific case. So I really enjoyed the content and just how much effort you put into the victim's stories. So thank you for that. I wanted to suggest a case. 
1997 in New South Wales, a 15-year-old girl named Jessica Small and her best friend, Vanessa Conlon, were abducted. They were hitchhiking. This man picked them up, and they were abducted. Uh, they both were able to get out of the car. Vanessa, Vanessa actually managed to escape from ripping her hair out of this man's hands. So she ripped her head away from his hands, and he ripped a fistful of hair out of her head. And Vanessa thought that Jessica was right behind her, but this man was unfortunately able to catch Jessica and drove off with her, screaming. Vanessa runs until she finds a house with a light on. She bangs on the door, and this woman comes to the door. She sees this young girl just absolutely terrified and disheveled. I mean, she's got a bald spot on her head. And call the police. The police don't believe Vanessa at all. They know of Vanessa and Jessica because these two girls have run away in the past. They were listed as troubled youth. So they just wrote off the story that Vanessa told them as a lie and never investigated Jessica's disappearance. Um, there was a man who had actually witnessed a car matching the description of the man that abducted Vanessa and Jessica, he saw this car racing down the street in the middle of the night with no headlights on, hearing a girl screaming out of the window. He tried to tell the cops, but the cops wouldn't take a statement. He had to force them to take a statement. And another point, a pair of bloodied girls' underwear and a rug, along with an empty bottle of bleach, was found in the woods. The police took this evidence and destroyed it. Jessica's mother didn't even know about this evidence until over a decade later. So, and the case is basically at a standstill. So, maybe you can give her some justice and tell her story better than I can. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. That is really disturbing. Isn't it is, that isn't terrible? It? This is a fairly famous case, I think. Okay, I'd never heard of it. So we might we might need to check into that. I think I would. I mean, it's just so brave that Vanessa was able to do that. Yeah. And just the fact that the police would not investigate it, the prejudging is really enraging. So, yes, I definitely would like to look into it some more. So I appreciate that suggestion. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Courtney. Now we got a couple emails. I have one from our good friend, Cindy. Sure. Who has a case suggestion. Okay, why don't you read Cindy's and I'll read the next one. I'll do that. Cindy says uh, she'd like to have an episode on the murder of Katie McCarran by her mother, Karen McCarran. Katie was an autistic three-year-old child. She says she knows how sensitive child cases are to us. She just wants some light shed on things from a pediatrician perspective. Quick summary. Karen Frank received her medical degree in 1995, and she married Paul McCarran shortly after that. She was employed as a pathologist. Her first daughter, Katie, was born in 2002 and in 2004 was diagnosed with autism. 2006, Karen suffocated Katie and she was tried and convicted and sentenced to 36 years in prison. She has bid on a new trial but was denied for that. So at present, she is in prison for so the did murder she, of her daughter. Did she admit to doing it or is she saying she's not guilty? I believe she's... Saying she's not guilty. Okay. I'd like to really see what the husband has to say about it, too. And if they're still married, that would be interesting to find out. I'm not sure they're still married. We can look at that. Absolutely, Cindy. Thank you. Cindy always sends us lots of suggestions, and we appreciate it. So our last email is from Jean with a case suggestion. Jean writes, I enjoy your podcast so much. Thank you for all the work you put into it. I have a crime story suggestion that was quite intriguing that I haven't seen covered anywhere. If you've ever watched Cold Justice, oh yeah, we love Cold Justice, the detective who was so relentless and eventually solved the case appears on that show sometimes. There was a book written in 1983 on the case, The Cop Who Wouldn't Quit, and now our local news channel is featured in a crime series. I hope you consider it. I think it would be a great story to tell, and I've attached a couple of links on the case for you. 
Well, thanks, Jean. That's great. We do watch Cold Justice pretty much every week. It's on Saturday nights on Oxygen. That's right. And we really enjoy it. Yeah, this this was a case of a, a murdered child, and it wasn't going anywhere. And the detective, Johnny Bonds, got a hold of this cold case file and just worked it and worked it and figured it out. So he's the cop who wouldn't quit. All right. I want to find a picture of him and see if he's the one I think he is. Okay. So let me find a picture. Cold Justice, it says right next to his name. Okay. I've seen him a lot. He's not the one I was hoping it was. I was hoping <laughs> it was the one that kind of bickers with her, and I think they're really cute together. But yes, I've seen him plenty of times, so we'll definitely look into that, Gene. We will. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your feedback and for spending this time with us. We really appreciate it. And I hope we'll get some more feedback. We always love to hear about new cases or your input on cases that we've already covered or cases that are in the news right now. Of course, we know right now that the Lori Daybell trial is going on, and that's really fascinating. So that's something we'd be happy to talk about as well. We would. All right. So thank you so much, and we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. Come on down. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. 